Welcome to Stories with Liz. Today I thought we'd start on a new adventure. It is called Tales of Arabian Nights, also known as A Thousand and One Tales of Arabian Nights. Introduction In the chronicles of the ancient dynasty of the Sassanidae, who reigned for about 500 years, from Persia to the borders of China, beyond the great river Ganges itself, we read the praises of one of the kings of this race, who was said to be the best monarch of his time. His subjects loved him, and his neighbors feared him, and when he died, he left his kingdom in a more prosperous and powerful condition than any king had done before him. The two sons who survived him loved each other tenderly, and it was a real grief to the elder, Shahariar, that the laws of the empire forbade him to share his domains with his brother, Shahazaman. Indeed, after ten years, during which this state of things had not ceased to trouble him, Shahariar cut off the country of great Tartary from the Persian empire and made his brother king. Now the Sultan Shariar had a wife, whom he loved more than all the world, and his greatest happiness was to surround her with splendor and to give her the finest dresses and the most beautiful jewels. It was therefore with the deepest shame and sorrow that he accidentally discovered after several years that she had deceived him completely and her whole conduct turned out to have been so bad that he felt himself obliged to carry out the law of the land and ordered the Grand Vizier to put her to death. The blow was so heavy that his mind almost gave way, and he declared that he was quite sure that at bottom all women was as wicked as the Sultana. If you could only find them out, and that the fewer the world contained, the better. So every evening he married a fresh wife and had her strangled the following morning before the Grand Vizier, whose duty it was to provide these unhappy brides for the Sultan. The poor man fulfilled his task with reluctance, but there was no escape, and every day he saw a girl married and a wife dead. This behavior caused the greatest terror in the town where nothing was heard but cries and lamentations. In one house was a father weeping for the loss of his daughter, in another perhaps a mother trembling for the fate of her child, and instead of the blessings that had formerly been heaped on the sultan's head, the air was now filled with curses. The grand vizier himself was the father of two daughters, of whom the elder was called Scheherazade and the younger Dinarazade. Dinarazad had no particular gifts to distinguish her from the other girls, but her sister was clever and courageous in the highest degree. Her father had given her the best masters in philosophy, medicine, history, and the fine arts, and besides all this, her beauty excelled that of any girl of the kingdom of Persia. One day, when the Grand Vizier was talking to his eldest daughter, who was his delight and pride, Shehezerod said to him, Father, I have a favor to ask of you. Will you grant it to me? I can refuse you nothing, replied he. That is just and reasonable. Then listen, said Shehezerod. I am determined to stop this barbaric practice of the sultans and to deliver the girls and mothers from the awful fate that hangs over them. It would be an excellent thing to do, returned the Grand Vizier. But how do you propose to accomplish it? My father, answered Shahrazad, it is you who have to provide the Sultan daily with fresh wife, and I implore you, by all the affection you bear me, to allow the honor to fall upon me. Have you lost your senses? cried the Grand Vizier, starting back in horror. What has put such a thing into your head? Surely you ought to know by now what it means to be the Sultan's bride. 
Yes, my father, I know it well, replied she, and I'm not afraid to think of it. If I fail, my death will be a glorious one, and if I succeed, I shall have done a great service to my country. It is of no use, said the Grand Vizier. I shall never consent. If the Sultan was to order me to plunge a dagger into your heart, I should have to obey. What a task for a father! Ah, oh, if you do not fear death, fear at any rate the anguish you would cause me. Once again, my father, said Shahrazad, will you grant me what I ask? What, are you still so obstinate? exclaimed the Grand Vizier. But are you so resolved upon your own ruin? But the maiden absolutely refused to attend to her father's word, and at length in despair the Grand Vizier was obliged to give way and went sadly to the palace to tell the Sultan that the following evening he would bring him Scheherazade. The Sultan received this news with the greatest astonishment. How have you made up your mind, he asked, to sacrifice your own daughter to me? Sire, answered the Grand Vizier, it is her own wish. Even the sad fate that awaits her could not hold her back. Let there be no mistake, Vizier, said the Sultan. Remember, you will have to take her life yourself. If you refuse, I swear that your head shall pay for it. Sire, returned the vizier, whatever the cost, I will obey you. Though a father, I am also your subject. So the sultan told the grand vizier he might bring his daughter as soon as he liked. The vizier took back his news to Scheherazade, who received it as if it had been the most pleasant thing in the world. She thanked her father warmly for yielding to her wishes, and, seeing him still bowed down with grief, told him that she hoped he would never repent having allowed her to marry the sultan. Then she went off to prepare herself for the marriage, and begged that her sister Dinarzad should be sent for to speak with her. When they were alone, Scheherazade addressed her thus, My dear sister, I want your help in a very important affair. My father is going to take me to the palace to celebrate my marriage with the Sultan. When his highness receives me, I shall beg him, as a last favor, to let you sleep in our chamber, so that I may have your company during the last night I am alive. If, as I hope, he grants me my wish, be sure that you wake me an hour before the dawn and speak to me in these words. My sister, if you are not asleep, I beg you, before the sun rises, to tell me one of your charming stories. Then I shall begin, and I hope by this means, to deliver the people from the terror that reigns over them. Dinarazar replied that she would do with pleasure what her sister wished. When the usual hour arrived, the Grand Vizier conducted Scheherazade to the palace and left her alone with the Sultan, who bade her raise her veil, and he was amazed at her beauty. But seeing her eyes full of tears, he asked what was the matter. Sire, replied Scheherazade, I have a sister who loves me as tenderly as I love her. Grant me the favor of allowing her to sleep this night in the same room, as it is the last that we shall be together. Shahariar consented to Shahrazad's petition, and Dinarazad was sent for. An hour before daybreak, Dinarazad awoke and exclaimed as she had promised, My dear sister, if you are not asleep, tell me, I pray you, before the sun rises, one of your charming stories. It is the last time that I shall have the pleasure of hearing you. Scheherazade did not answer her sister, but turned to the sultan. Will your highness permit me to do what my sister asks? said she. Willingly, he answered. So Scheherazade began. Chapter 1, then. 
The Story of the Merchant and the Genius Sire, there was once upon a time a merchant who possessed great wealth in land and merchandise as well as in ready money. He was obliged from time to time to take journeys to arrange his affairs. One day, having to go a long way from home, he mounted his horse, taking with him a small wallet in which he had put a few biscuits and dates because he had to pass through the desert where there was no food to be got. He arrived without any mishap, and having finished his business, set out on his return. On the fourth day of his journey, the heat and the sun being very great, he turned out of his road to rest under some trees. He found at the foot of a large walnut tree a fountain of clear and running water. He dismounted, fastened his horse to a branch of a tree, and sat by the fountain after having taken from his wallet some of his dates and biscuits. When he had finished his frugal meal, he washed his face and hands in the fountain. When he was thus employed, he saw an enormous genius, white with rage, coming towards him with a scimitar, a sort of saber in his hand. Arise, he cried in a terrible voice, and let me kill you as you have killed my son. As he uttered these words, he gave a frightful yell. The merchant, quite as much terrified at the hideous face of the monster, as at his words, answered him tremblingly, Alas, good sir, what can I have done to deserve death? I shall kill you, repeated the genius, as you have killed my son. But, said the merchant, how can I have killed your son? I do not know him, and I have never seen him. When you have arrived here, did you not sit down on the ground? asked the genius. And did you not take some dates from your wallet, and whilst eating them, did you not throw the stones about? Yes, said the merchant. I certainly did so. Then, said the genius, I tell you, you have killed my son. For whilst you were throwing about stones, my son passed by, and one of them struck him in his eye and killed him. So, I shall kill you. Oh, sir, forgive me, cried the merchant. I will have no mercy on you, answered the genius. But I killed your son quite unintentionally, so I implore you to spare my life. No, said the genius. I shall kill you as you killed my son. And so saying, he seized the merchant by the arm, threw him on the ground, and lifted his saber to cut off his head. The merchant, protesting his innocent, bewailed his wife and children, and tried pitifully to avert his fate. The genius, with his raised scimitar, waited till he had finished, but was not in the least touched. Scheherazade, at this point, seeing that it was day, and knowing that the sultan always rose very early to attend the council, stopped speaking. Indeed, sister, said Dinarzad, this is a wonderful story. The rest is still more wonderful, replied Scheherazade, and you would say so if the sultan would allow me to live another day and would give me the leave to tell it to you the next night. Shahariyar, who had been listening to Shahrazad with pleasure, said to himself, I will wait till tomorrow. I can always have her killed when I've heard the end of her story. All this time the Grand Vizier was in terrible state of anxiety, but he was much delighted when he saw the Sultan enter the council chamber without giving the terrible command that he was expecting. The next morning, before day broke, Dinarzad said to her sister, Dear sister, if you are awake, I pray you to go on with your story. The sultan did not wait for Shahrazad to ask his leave. Finish, said he, the story of the genius and the merchant. I am curious to hear the end. So Shahrazad went on with the story. This happened every morning. The sultana told a story, 
and the Sultan let her live to finish it. When the merchant saw that the genius was determined to cut off his head, he said, One more word, I entreat you. Grant me a little delay, just a short time to go home and bid my wife and children farewell, and to make my will. When I have done this, I will come back here, and you shall kill me. But, said the genius, if I grant you the delay you ask, I am afraid you won't come back. I give you my word of honor, answered the merchant, that I will come back without fail. How long do you require? asked the genius. I ask you for a year's grace, replied the merchant. I promise you that tomorrow twelve month I shall be waiting under these trees to give myself up to you. On this, the genius left him near the fountain and disappeared. The merchant, having recovered from his fright, mounted his horse and went on his road. When he arrived home, his wife and children received him with the greatest joy. But instead of embracing them, he began to weep so bitterly that they soon guessed that something terrible was the matter. Tell us, I pray you, said the wife, what has happened? At last, answered her husband, I have only one year to live. Then he told them what had passed between him and the genius, and how he had given his word to return at the end of the year to be killed. When they heard the sad news, they were in despair and wept much. The next day the merchant began to settle his affairs, and first of all to pay his debts. He gave presents to his friends and large alms to the poor. He set his slaves at liberty and provided for his wife and children. The year soon passed away and he was obliged to depart. When he tried to say goodbye, he was quite overcome with grief and with difficulty tore himself away. At length he reached the place where he had first seen the genius on the very day that he had appointed. He dismounted and sat down at the edge of the fountain, where he waited the genius in terrible suspense. Whilst he was thus waiting, an old man leading a hind came towards him. They greeted one another, and then the old man said to him, May I ask, brother, what brought you to this desert place, where there are so many evil genii about? To see these beautiful trees, one would imagine it was inhabited but it is a dangerous place to stop long in. The merchant told the old man why he was obliged to come there. He listened in astonishment. This is a most marvelous affair. I should like to be a witness of your interview with the genius. So saying, he sat down by the merchant. While they were talking, another man came up, followed by two black dogs. He greeted them and asked what they were doing in this place. The old man who was leading the hind told him the adventure of the merchant and the genius. The second old man had no sooner heard the story than he too decided to stay there to see what would happen. He sat down by the others and was talking when a third old man arrived. He asked why the merchant who was with him looked so sad. They told him the story and he also resolved to see what would pass between the genius and the merchant so waited with the rest. They soon saw in the distance a thick smoke like a cloud of dust. The smoke came nearer and nearer. And then all at once it vanished and they saw the genius who, without speaking to them, approached the merchant sword in hand and, taking him by the arms, said, Get up and let me kill you as you killed my son. The merchant and the three old men began to weep and groan. The old man, leading the hen, threw himself at the monster's feet and said, O oh, prince of the genie, I beg of you to stay your hand and listen to me. I am going to tell you my story of that of the hen I have with me, and if you find it more marvelous than that of the merchant whom you are about to kill, I hope that you will do away with the third part of his punishment. The genius considered for some time, and then he said, Very well, I agree to this. 
The end. Part two of Tales of Arabian Nights. And it is called The Story of the First Old Man and of the Hind. I am now going to begin my story, said the old man. So please attend. This hind that you see with me is my wife. We have no children of our own. Therefore, I adopted the son of a favorite slave and determined to make him my heir. My wife, however, took a great dislike to both mother and child, which she concealed from me till too late. When my adopted son was about ten years old, I was obliged to go on a journey. Before I went, I entrusted to my wife's keeping both the mother and child and begged her to take care of them during my absence which lasted a whole year. During this time, she studied magic in order to carry out her wicked scheme. When she had learned enough, she took my son into a distant place and changed him into a calf. Then she gave him to my steward and told him to look after a calf she had bought. She also changed the slave into a cow, which she sent to my steward. When I returned, I inquired after my slave and the child. Your slave is dead, she said. And as for your son, I have not seen him for two months, and I do not know where he is. I was grieved to hear of my slave's death, but as my son had only disappeared, I thought I should soon find him. Eight months, however, passed and still no tidings of him. Then the Feast of Barium came. To celebrate it, I ordered my steward to bring me a very fat cow to sacrifice. He did so. The cow that he brought was my unfortunate slave. I bound her, but just as I was about to kill her, she began to low most piteously, and I saw that her eyes was streaming with tears. It seemed to me most extraordinary, and feeling a movement of pity, I ordered the steward to lead her away and bring me another. My wife, who was present, scoffed at my compassion, which made her malice of no avail. What are you doing? she cried. Kill this cow. It is the best we have to sacrifice. To please her, I tried again, but again the animal's low and tears disarmed me. Take her away, I said to the steward, and kill her. I cannot. The steward killed her, but on skinning her, found that she was nothing but bones, although she appeared so fat. I was vexed. Keep her for yourself, I said to the steward, and if you have a fat calf, Bring that in her stead. In a short time, he brought a very fat calf, which, although I did not know it, was my son. It tried hard to break its cord and come to me. It threw itself at my feet with its head on the ground as if it wished to excite my pity and to beg me not to take away its life. I was even more surprised and touched at this action than I had been at the tears of the cow. Go, I said to the steward, take back this calf, take great care of it, and bring me another in its place instead. As soon as my wife heard me speak this, she at once cried out, What are you doing, husband? Do not sacrifice any calf but this. Wife, I answered, I will not sacrifice this calf. And in spite of all of her remonstrances, I remained firm. I had another calf killed. This one was led away. The next day, the steward asked to speak to me in private. I have come, he said, to tell you some news, which I think you would like to hear. I have a daughter who knows magic. Yesterday, when I was leading back the calf which he refused to sacrifice, I noticed that she smiled, and then directly afterwards began to cry. I asked her why she did so. 
Father, she answered, this calf is the son of our master. I smile with joy at seeing him still alive, and I weep to think of his mother, who was sacrificed yesterday as a cow. These changes has been wrought out by our master's wife, who hated the mother and the son. At these words, O oh genius, continued the old man, I leave you to imagine my astonishment. I went immediately with the steward to speak with his daughter myself. First of all, I went to the stable to see my son, and he replied in his dumb way to all my caresses. When the steward's daughter came, I asked her if she could change my son back into his proper shape. Yes, I can, she said, on two conditions. One is that you will give him to me for a husband, and the other is that you will let me punish the woman who changed him into a calf. To the first condition, I answered, I agree with all my heart, and I will give you an ample dowry to the second, I also agree. I only beg you to spare her life. That I will do, she replied. I will treat her as she treated your son. Then she took a vessel of water and pronounced over it some words I did not understand. Then, on throwing the water over him, he became immediately a young man once more. My son, my dear son, I exclaimed, kissed him in a transport of joy. This young maiden has rescued you from a terrible enchantment, and I am sure that out of gratitude you will marry her. He consented joyfully, but before they were married, the young girl changed my wife into a hind, and it is she whom you see before you. I wished her to have this form rather than a stranger one, so that we could see her in the family without repugnance. Since then my son has become a widower and has gone traveling. I am now going in search of him. And not wishing to confine my wife to the care of other people, I am taking her with me. Is this not a most marvelous tale? Yes, indeed said the genius, and because of it, I grant to you the third part of the punishment of this merchant. When the first old man had finished his story, the second, who was leading the two black dogs, said to the genius, I am going to tell you what happened to me, and I am sure that you will find my story even more astonishing than the one you have just been listening. But when I have related it, Will you grant me also the third part of the merchant's punishment? Yes, replied the genius, provided that your story surpasses that of the hind. With this agreement, the second old man began in this way. Part 3 of Tales of the Arabian Nights The story of the second old man and his two black dogs. Great Prince of the Genii, you must know that we are three brothers, these two black dogs and myself. Our father died, leaving us each a thousand sequins. With this sum, we all three took up the same profession and became merchants. A short time after we had opened our shops, my eldest brother, one of these two dogs, resolved to travel in foreign countries for the sake of merchandise. With this intention, he sold all he had and bought merchandise suitable to the voyages he was about to make. He set out and he was away a whole year. At the end of this time, a beggar came to my shop. Good day, I said. Good day, he answered. Is it possible that you do not recognize me? Then I looked at him closely and saw that he was my brother. I made him come into my house and asked him how he had fared in his enterprise. Do not question me, 
he replied. See me, you see all that I have. It would but renew my trouble to tell you of all the misfortunes that have befallen me in a year and have brought me to this state. I shut up my shop, paid him every attention, taking him to the bath, giving him my most beautiful robes. I examined my accounts and found that I had doubled my capital. That is, that I now possess two thousand sequins. I gave my brother half, saying, Now, brother, you can forget your losses. He accepted them with joy, and we lived together as we had done before. Some time afterward, my second brother wished also to sell his business and travel. My eldest brother and I did all we could to dissuade him, but it was of no use. He joined a caravan and set out. He came back at the end of a year in the same state as his elder brother. I took care of him, and as I had a thousand sequins to spare, I gave them to him, and he reopened his shop. One day, my two brothers came to me to propose that we should make a journey and trade. At first, I refused to go. You traveled, I said, and what did you gain? But they came to me repeatedly, and after having held out for five years, I at last gave way. But when they had made their preparations, and they began to buy the merchandise we needed, they found that they had spent every piece of the thousand sequins I had given them. I did not reproach them. I divided my six thousand sequins with them, giving a thousand to each and keeping one for myself, and the other three I buried in a corner of my house. We bought merchandise, loaded a vessel with it, and set forth with a favorable wind. After two months sailing, we arrived at a seaport, where we disembarked and did a great trade. Then we bought the merchandise of the country, and were just going to sail once more when I was stopped on the shore by a beautiful though poorly dressed woman. She came up to me kissed my hand and implored me to marry her and take her on board. At first I refused, but she begged so hard and promised to be such a good wife to me that at last I consented. I got her some beautiful dresses, and after having married her, we embarked and set sail. During the voyage, I discovered so many good qualities in my wife that I began to love her more and more. But my brothers began to be jealous of my prosperity, and set to work to plot against my life. One night, when we were sleeping, they threw my wife and myself into the sea. My wife, however, was a fairy. And so she did not let me drown, but transported me to an island. When the day dawned, she said to me, When I saw you on the seashore, I took a great fancy to you and wished to try your good nature, so I presented myself in the disguise you saw. Now I have rewarded you by saving your life. But I am very angry with your brothers, and I shall not rest till I have taken their lives. I thanked the fairy for all that she had done for me, but I begged her not to kill my brothers. I appeased her wrath, and in a moment she transported me from the island where we were to the roof of my house, and she disappeared a moment afterwards. I went down and opened the door and dug up the three thousand sequins which I had buried. I went to the place where my shop was, opened it, and received from my fellow merchants congratulations on my return. When I went home, I saw two black dogs that came to meet me with sorrowful faces. I was much astonished, but the fairy who reappeared said to me, Do not be surprised to see these dogs. They are your two brothers. I have condemned them to remain for ten years in this shape. Then, having told me where I could hear news of her, she vanished. The ten years are nearly past, and I am on the road to find her. 
as in passing I meet this merchant and the old man with a hind, I stayed with them. This is my story, O Prince of Gina. Do you not think that it is a marvelous one? Yes, indeed, said the genius, and I will give up to you the third part of the merchant's punishment. Then the third old man made the genius the same request as the other two had done, and the genius promised him the last third of the merchant's punishment, if his story surpassed both the others. So he told his story to the genius, but I cannot tell you what it was, as I do not know. But I do know that it was even more marvelous than either of the others, so that the genius was astonished and said to the third old man, I will give you the third part of the merchant's punishment. He ought to thank all three of you for having interested yourself in his favor, but for you, he would be here no longer. So saying, he disappeared to the great joy of the company. The merchant did not fail to thank his friends and then each went on his way. The merchant returned to his wife and children and passed the rest of his days happily with them. But sire, added Scheherazade, however beautiful are the stories I have related, they cannot compare to the story of the fisherman. Part 4 of Tales of Arabian Nights which is called The Fisherman's Story. Sire, there was once upon a time a fisherman, so old and so poor, that he could scarcely manage to support his wife and three children. He went every day to fish very early, and each day he made a rule not to throw his net more than four times. He started out one morning by moonlight and came to the seashore. He undressed and threw his net, and as he was drawing them towards the bank, he felt a great weight. He thought he had caught a large fish, and he felt very pleased. But a moment afterwards, seeing that instead of a fish, he only had in his net the carcass of an ass. He was much disappointed. Vexed with having such a bad haul, he had mended his nets, which the carcass of the ass had broken in several places. He threw them a second time. Drawing them in, he again felt a great weight so that he thought they were full of fish, but he only found a large basket full of rubbish. He was much annoyed. Oh, fortune, he cried, do not trifle thus with me, a poor fisherman who can hardly support his family. So saying, he threw away the rubbish, and after having washed his net clean of the dirt, he threw them for a third time, but he only drew in stones, shell, and mud. He was almost in despair. Then he threw his net for the fourth time. When he thought he had a fish, he drew them in with a great deal of trouble. There was no fish, however, but he found a yellow pot, which by its weight seemed full of something, and he noticed that it was fastened and sealed with lead, with the impression of a seal. He was delighted. I will sell it to the founder he said with the money i shall get for it i shall buy a measure of wheat he examined the jar on all sides he shook it to see if it would rattle but he heard nothing and so judging from the impression of the seal and the lid he thought there must be something precious inside to find out he took his knife and with a little trouble he opened it he turned it upside down, but nothing came out, which surprised him. He set it in front of him, and whilst he was looking at it attentively, such a thick smoke came out that he had to step back a pace or two. 
the smoke rose up to the clouds and stretching over the sea and the shore formed a thick mist which caused the fishermen much astonishment. When all the smoke was out of the jar it gathered itself together and became a thick mass in which appeared a genius, twice as large as the largest giant. When he saw such a terrible looking monster the fishermen would like to have run away but he trembled so with fright that he could not move a step. Great king of the genii, cried the monster, I will never again disobey you. At these words the fisherman took courage. What is this you are saying, great genius? Tell me your history and how you came to be shut up in that vase. At this the genius looked at the fisherman haughtily. Speak to me more civilly, he said, before I kill you. Alas, why should you kill me? cried the fisherman. I have just freed you. Have you already forgotten that? No, said the genius, but that will not prevent me from killing you, and I am only going to grant you one favor, and that is to choose the manner of your death. But what have I done to you? asked the fisherman. I cannot treat you in any other way, said the genius, and if you would know why, listen to my story. I rebelled against the king of the genie. To punish me, he shut me up in this vase of copper, and he put on the leaden cover his seal, which is enchanted enough to prevent my coming out. Then he had the vase thrown into the sea. During the first period of my captivity, I vowed that if anyone should free me before a hundred years were passed, I should make him rich even after his death. But that century passed, and nobody freed me. In the second century, I vowed that I would give all the treasures in the world to my deliverer, but he never came. In the third, I promised to make him a king, to be always near him and to grant him three wishes every day. But that century passed away as the other two had done, and I remained in the same plight. At last I grew angry at being captive for so long, and I vowed that if anyone would release me, I would kill him at once and I would only allow him to choose in what manner he should die. So you see, as you have freed me today, choose in what way you will die. The fisherman was very unhappy. What an unlucky man am I to have freed you. I implore you to spare my life. I have told you, said the genies, that is impossible. Choose quickly, you are wasting time. The fisherman began to devise a plot. Since I must die, he said, before I choose the manner of my death, I conjure you on your honor to tell me if you really were in that vase. Yes, I was, answered the genius. I really cannot believe it, said the fisherman. That vase could not contain one of your feet even, and how could your whole body go in? I cannot believe it unless I see you do the thing. Then the genius began to change himself into smoke, which as before spread over the sea and the shore, and which, then collecting itself together, began to go back into the vase slowly and evenly till there was nothing left outside. Then a voice came from the vase which said to the fisherman, Well, unbelieving fisherman, here I am in the vase. Do you believe me now? The fisherman, instead of answering, took the lid of lead and shut it down quickly on the vase. Now, O oh genies, he cried, ask pardon of me and choose by what death you will die. But no, 
It will be better if I throw you into the sea once I drew you out, and I will build a house on the shore to warn fishermen who come to cast their nets here against fishing up such a wicked genius as you, who vows to kill the man who frees you. At these words the genius did all he could to get out, but he could not because of the enchanted lid. Then he tried to get out by cunning. If you will take off the cover, he said, I will repay you. No, answered the fisherman. If I trust myself to you, I am afraid you will treat me as a certain Greek king treated the physician Dubian. Listen, and I will tell you. The Story of the Greek King and the Physician Dubian In the country of Zuman in Persia, there lived a Greek king. The king was a leper, and all his doctors had been unable to cure him, when a very clever physician came to his court. He was very learned in all languages and knew a great deal about herbs and medicines. As soon as he was told of the king's illness, he put on his best robe and presented himself to the king. Sire, he said, I know that no physician has been able to cure your majesty, but if you will follow my instructions, I will promise to cure you without any medicines or outward applications. The king listened to his proposal. If you are clever enough to do this, he said, I promise to make you and your descendants rich forever. The physician went to his house and made a polo club, the handle of which he hollowed out and put in it the drug he wished to use. Then he made a ball, and with these things he went to the king the next day. He told him that he wished him to play polo. Accordingly, the king mounted his horse and went into the place where he played. There the physician approached him with the bat that he had made, saying, Take this, sire, and strike the ball till you feel your hand and whole body in a glow. When the remedy that is in the handle of the club is warmed by your hand, it will penetrate throughout your body. Then you must return to your palace, bathe, and go to sleep. And when you awake tomorrow morning, you will be cured. The king took the club and urged his horse after the ball, which he had thrown. He struck it, and then it was hit back by the courtiers who were playing with him. When he felt very hot, he stopped playing and went back to the palace, went to the bath, and did all that the physician had said. The next day when he arose, he found, to his great joy and astonishment, that he was completely cured. When he entered his audience chamber, all his courtiers, who were eager to see if the wonderful cure had been effected, were overwhelmed with joy. The physician, Dubian, entered the hall and bowed low to the ground. The king, seizing him, called him, made him sit by his side, and showed him every mark of honor. That evening he gave him a long and rich robe of state and presented him with two thousand sequins. The following day he continued to load him with favors. Now the king had a grand vizier who was avaricious and envious and a very bad man. He grew extremely jealous of the physician and determined to bring about his ruin. In order to do this, he asked to speak in private with the king, saying that he had the most important communication to make. What is it? asked the king. Sire, answered the Grand Vizier, it is most dangerous for a monarch to confide in a man whose faithfulness is not proved. You do not know that this physician is not a traitor come here to assassinate you. I am sure, said the king, that this man is the most faithful and virtuous of men. If he wished to take my life, why did he cure me? Cease to speak against him. 
I see what it is. You are jealous of him, but do not think that I can be turned against him. I remember well what a vizier said to King Simbad, his master, to prevent him from putting the prince, his son, to death. What the Greek king said excited the vizier's curiosity, and he said to him, Sire, I beg your majesty to have the condensation to tell me what the vizier said to the king Simbad. The vizier, he replied, told king Simbad that one ought not to believe everything that a mother-in-law says, and told him this story. The story of the husband and the parrot. A good man had a beautiful wife, whom he loved passionately and never left if possible. One day when he was obliged by important business to go away from her, he went to a place where all kinds of birds are sold and bought a parrot. This parrot not only spoke well, but it had the gift of telling all that had been done before it. He brought it home in a cage and asked his wife to put it in her room and take great care of it while he was away. Then he departed. On his return, he asked the parrot what had happened during his absence, and the parrot told him some things which made him scold his wife. She thought at once that one of her slaves must have been telling tales of her, but they told her it was the parrot, and so she resolved to revenge herself on it. When her husband next went away for a day, she told one slave to turn under the bird's cage a hand mill, and other to throw water down from above the cage, and a third to take a mirror and turn it in front of its eyes, from left to right by the light of a candle. The slaves did this for part of the night and did it very well. The next day when the husband came back, he asked the parrot what he had seen. The bird replied, My good master, the lightning, thunder, and rain disturbed me so much all night long that I cannot tell you how I have suffered. The husband, who knew that it had neither rain nor thundered in the night, was convinced that the parrot was not speaking the truth so he took him out of the cage and threw him roughly on the ground that he killed him. Nevertheless, he was sorry afterwards, for he found that the parrot had spoken the truth. When the great king, said the fisherman to the genius, had finished the story of the parrot, he added to the vizier, and so vizier, I shall not listen to you, and I shall take care of the physician in case I repent as the husband did when he had killed the parrot. But the vizier was determined. Sire, he replied, the death of the parrot was nothing, but when it is a question of the life of a king, it is better to sacrifice the innocents than save the guilty. It is no uncertain thing, however, the physician Dubian wishes to assassinate you. My seal prompts me to disclose this to your majesty. If I am wrong, I deserve to be punished as a vizier was once punished. What had the vizier done, said the Greek king, to merit the punishment? I will tell you, majesty, if you will do me the honor to listen, answered the vizier. The story of the vizier who was punished. There once upon a time was a king who had a son who was very fond of hunting. He often allowed him to indulge in this pastime, but he had ordered his grand vizier always to go with him and never to lose sight of him. One day the huntsman roused his stag, and the prince, thinking that the vizier was behind, gave chase and rode so hard that he found himself alone. He stopped, and having lost sight of it, he turned to rejoin the vizier, who had not been careful enough to follow him, but he lost his way. Whilst he was trying to find it, he saw on the side of the road a 
beautiful lady who was crying bitterly. He drew his horse's rein and asked her who she was and what she was doing in this place and if she needed help. I am the daughter of an Indian king, she answered, and whilst riding in the country, I fell asleep and tumbled off. My horse has run away, and I don't know what has become of him. The young prince had pity on her and offered to take her behind him, which he did. As they passed by a ruined building, the lady dismounted and went in. The prince also dismounted and followed her. To his great surprise, he heard her saying to someone inside, Rejoice, my children, I am bringing you a nice fat youth. And other voices replied, Where is he, mamma, that we may eat him at once, as we are so hungry? The prince saw at once the danger he was in. He now knew that the lady who said she was a daughter of an Indian king was an ogress who lived in desolate places and who by a thousand wiles surprised and devoured passers-by. He was terrified and threw himself on his horse. The pretended princess appeared at this moment and seeing she had lost her prey, said to him, Do not be afraid. What do you want? I am lost, he answered, and I am looking for the road. Keep straight on, said the ogress, and you will find it. The prince could hardly believe his ears and rode off as hard as he could. He found his way and arrived safe and sound at his father's house, where he told him of the dangers he had run because of the grand vizier's carelessness. The king was very angry and had him strangled immediately. Sire, went the vizier to the Greek king, to return to the physician Dubian. If you do not take care, you will repent of having trusted him. Who knows what this remedy with which he has cured you may not in time have a bad effect on you. The Greek king was naturally weak and did not perceive the wicked intention of his vizier, nor was he firm enough to keep to his resolution. Well, wizard, he said, you are right. Perhaps he did come to take my life. He might do it by the mere smell of one of his drugs. I must see what can be done. The best means, sire, to put your life in security is to send for him at once and to cut off his head directly as he comes, said the vizier. I really think, replied the king, that will be the best way. He then ordered one of his ministers to fetch the physician, who came at once. I have had you sent for, said the king, in order to free myself from you by taking your life. The physician was beyond measure astonished when he heard he was to die. What, what crimes have I committed, your majesty? I have learned, replied the king, that you are a spy intent to kill me, but I will be first and kill you. Strike! he added to an executioner who was by, and rid me of this assassin. At this cruel order, the physician threw himself on his knees. Spare my life, he cried, and yours will be spared. The fisherman stopped here to say to the genius, You see, what happened between the Greek king and the physician has just passed between us two. The Greek king, he went on, had no mercy on him, and the executioner bound his eyes. The physician, on his knees, bound, said to the king, At least let me put my affairs in order, and leave my books to persons who will make good use of them. There is one which I should like to present to you, your majesty. It is very precious, and ought to be kept carefully in your treasury. It contains many curious things, the chief thing being that, when you cut off my head, if your majesty will turn to the sixth leaf and read the third line of the left-hand page, 
My head will answer any question you would like to ask it. The king, eager to see such a wonderful thing, put off his execution to the next day and sent him under strong guard to his house. There the physician put his affairs in order, and the next day there was a great crowd assembled in the hall to see his death and the doings thereafter. The physician went up to the foot of the throne with a large book in his hand and carried a basin on which he spread the covering of the book and presenting it to the king said, Sire, take this book and when my head is cut off, let it be placed in the basin on the covering of this book. As soon as it is there, the blood will cease to flow. Then open the book and my head will answer your question. But sire... I implore your mercy, for I am innocent. Your prayers are useless, and if we're only to hear your head speak when you are dead, you should die. So saying, he took the book from the physician's hand and ordered the executioner to do his duty. The head was so cleverly cut off that it fell into the basin, and directly the blood ceased to flow. Then, to the great astonishment of the king, the eyes opened and the head said, Your majesty, open the book. And the king did so, and finding that the first leaf struck against the second, he put his finger into his mouth to turn it more easily. He did the same thing till he reached the sixth page, and not seeing anything written on it, Physician, he said, there is no writing. Turn over a few more pages, answered the head. The king went on turning, still putting his finger in his mouth, till the poison in which each page was dipped took effect. His sight failed him, and he fell at the foot of his throne. When the physician's head saw that the poison had taken effect, and that the king had only a few more minutes to live, Tyrant, it said, See how cruelty and injustice are punished. Scarcely had it uttered these words than the king died, and the head lost also the little life that had remained in it. That is the end of the story of the Greek king, and now let us return to the fisherman and the genius. If the Greek king, said the fisherman, had spared the physician, he would not thus have died. The same thing applies to you. Now I am going to throw you back into the sea. My friend, said the genius, do not do such a cruel thing. Do not treat me as Emma treated Attica. What did Emma do to Attica? asked the fisherman. Do you think I can tell you while I'm shut up in here? replied the genius. Let me out and I will make you rich. The hope of being no longer poor made the fisherman give way. If you will give me your promise to do this, I will open the lid. I do not think you dare to break your word. The genius promised, and the fisherman lifted the lid. He came out at once in smoke, and then, having resumed his proper form, the first thing he did was to kick the vase into the sea. This frightened the fisherman. But the genius laughed and said, Do not be afraid. I only did it to frighten you and to show you that I intend to keep my word. Take your nets and follow me. He began to walk in front of the fisherman, who followed him with some misgivings. They passed in front of the town and went up a mountain and then down into a great plain where there was a large lake lying between four hills. When they reached the lake, the genius said to the fisherman, Throw your nets and catch fish. The fisherman did as he was told, hoping for a good catch, as he saw plenty of fish. What was his astonishment at seeing that there were four quite different kinds, some white, some red, some blue, and some yellow. He caught four, one of each color. As he had never seen any like them, he admired them very much, and he was very pleased to think how much money he would get for them. 
take this fish and carry them to the sultan. He will give you more money for them than you have ever had in your life. You can come every day to fish in this lake, but be careful not to throw your nets more than once every day. Otherwise, some harm will happen to you. If you follow my advice carefully, you will find it good. Saying these words, he struck his foot against the ground, which opened, and when he had disappeared, it closed immediately. The fisherman resolved to obey the genius exactly, so he did not cast his net a second time, but walked into the town to sell his fish at the palace. When the sultan saw the fish, he was much astonished. He looked at them one after the other, and when he had admired them long enough, Take these fish, he said to his first visitor, and give them to the clever cook the emperor of the Greeks sent me. I think they must be as good as they are beautiful. The visitor took them himself to the cook, saying, Here are four fishes that have been brought to the sultan. He wants you to cook them. Then he went back to the sultan, who told him to give the fisherman four hundred gold pieces. The fisherman, who had never before passed such a large sum of money at once, could hardly believe his good fortune. He at once revealed the needs of his family and made good use of it. But now we must return to the kitchen, which we shall find in great confusion. The cook, when she had cleaned the fish, put them in a pan with some oil to fry them. When she thought them cooked enough on one side, she turned them over on the other. But scarcely had she done so when the wall of the kitchen opened, and there came out a young and beautiful damsel. She was dressed in Egyptian dress of flowered satin, and she wore earrings and a necklace of white pearls, and bracelets of gold set with rubies, and she held a wand of myrtle in her hand. She went up to the pan, to the great astonishment of the cook, who stood motionless at the sight of her. She struck one of the fish with her rod. Fish, fish, she said, are you doing your duty? And the fish answered nothing, and then she repeated her question, whereupon they all raised their heads together and answered very distinctly. Yes, yes, if you reckon, we reckon. If you pay your debts, we pay ours. If you fly, we conquer, and we are content. When they had spoken, the girl upset the pan and entered the opening in the wall, which at once closed and appeared the same as before. When the cook had recovered from her fright, she lifted up the fish which had fallen into the ashes, but she found them as black as cinders and not fit to serve up to the sultan, and she began to cry. Alas, what shall I say to the sultan? He will be so angry with me, and I know he will not believe me. While she was crying, the grand vizier came in and asked if the fish were ready. She told him all that had happened, and he was much surprised. He sent at once for the fisherman, and when he came, said to him, Fisherman, bring me four more fish like you have brought already, for an accident has happened to them, so they cannot be served up to the sultan. The fisherman did not say what the genius had told him, but he excused himself from bringing them that day on account of the length of the way, and he promised to bring them the next day. In the night he went to the lake, cast his nets, and on drawing them in found four fish which were like the others, each of a different color. He went back at once and carried them to the grand vizier as he had promised. He then took them to the kitchen and shut himself up with the cook, who began to cook them as she had done the four others on the previous day. When she was about to turn them on the other side, the wall opened, the damsel appeared, addressed the same words to the fish, received the same answer, and then overturned the pan and disappeared. The grand vizier was filled with astonishment. I shall tell the sultan all that has happened, said he, and he did so. The sultan was very much astounded and wished to see this marvel for himself, so he sent for the fisherman and asked him to procure four more fish. The fisherman asked for three days, which he were granted. He then cast his net in the lake and again caught four different colored fish. 
The sultan was delighted to see he had caught them and gave him again 400 gold pieces. As soon as the sultan had the fish, he had them carried to his room with all that was needed to cook them. Then he shut himself up with the grand vizier who began to prepare them and cook them. When they were done on one side, he turned them over on the other. Then the wall of the room opened, but instead of the maiden, a black slave came out. He was enormously tall and carried a large green stick with which he touched the fish, saying in a terrible voice, Fish, fish, are you doing your duty? To these words, the fish lifting up their heads replied, Yes, yes, if you reckon, we reckon. If you pay your debts, we pay ours. If you fly, we conquer, and we are content. The black slave overturned the pan in the middle of the room, and the fish was turned to cinder. Then he stepped proudly into the wall, which closed around him. After seeing this, said the sultan, I cannot rest. These fish signified some mystery I must clear up. He sent for the fishermen. Fishermen, he said, the fish you have brought us have caused me some anxiety. Where did you get them from? Sire, he answered, I got them from a lake which lies in the middle of four hills beyond yonder mountains. Do you know this lake? The sultan asked the grand vizier. No, I have hunted many times round that mountain. I have never heard of it, said the vizier. As the fisherman said it was only three hours' journey away, the sultan ordered his whole court to mount and ride thither, and the fisherman led them. They climbed the mountain and then, on the other side, saw the lake as the fisherman had described. The water was so clear that they could see the four kinds of fish swimming about in it. They looked at them for some time, and then the sultan ordered them to make up a camp at the edge of the water. When night came, the sultan called the vizier and said to him, I have resolved to clear up this mystery. I am going out alone, and do you stay here in my tent, and when my ministers come tomorrow, say I am not well and cannot see them, do this each day until I return. The Grand Vizier tried to persuade the Sultan not to go, but in vain. The Sultan took off his state robe and put on his sword, and when he saw all was quiet in the camp, he went forth alone. He climbed one of the hills and then crossed a great plain. Till just the sun rose, he beheld far in front of him a large building, when he came near to it, he saw it was a splendid palace of beautiful black polished marble covered with steel as smooth as a mirror. He went to the gate which stood half open and went in as nobody came when he knocked. He passed through a magnificent courtyard and still saw no one, though he called out loud several times. He entered large halls where the carpets were of silk the lounges and sofas covered with tapestry from Mecca and the hangings of the most beautiful Indian stuffs of gold and silver. Then he found himself in a splendid room with a fountain supported by golden lions. The water of the lion's mouth turned into diamonds and pearls and the leaping water almost touched a most beautifully painted dome. The place was surrounded on three sides by magnificent gardens, little lakes and woods. Birds sang in the trees, which were netted over to keep them always there. Still, the sultan saw no one, till he heard a plaintive cry and a voice which said, Oh, that I could die, for I am too unhappy to wish to live any longer. The sultan looked round to discover who it was who thus bemoaned his fate, and at last saw a handsome young man, richly clothed, who was sitting on a throne raised slightly from the ground, and his face was very sad. The sultan approached him and bowed to him. The young man bent his head very low, but did not rise. Sire, he said to the sultan, I cannot rise and do you the reverence that I am sure should be paid to your rank. Sir, answered the sultan, I am sure you have good reason for not doing so, 
and having heard your cry of distress, I have come to offer you my help. Whose is this palace, and why is it thus empty? Instead of answering, the young man lifted up his robe and showed the sultan that, from his waist downwards, he was a block of black marble. The sultan was horrified and begged the young man to tell him his story. Willingly, I will tell you my sad history, said the young man. The story of the young king of the Black Isles. You must know, sire, that my father was Muhammad, the king of this country, the Black Isles, so called from the four little mountains which were once islands, while the capital was the place where you now see the great lake lie. My story will tell you how these changes came about. My father died when he was sixty-six, and I succeeded him. I married my cousin, whom I loved tenderly, and I thought she loved me too, but one afternoon, when I was half asleep and was being fanned by two of her maids, I heard one say to the other, what a pity it is that our mistress no longer loves our master. I believe she would like to kill him if she could, for she is an enchantress. I soon found by watching that they were right, and when I mortally wounded a favorite slave of hers for a great crime, she begged that she might build a palace in the garden where she wept and bewailed him for two years. At last I begged her to cease grieving for him, for although he could not speak or move by her enchantments, she just kept him alive. She turned upon me in a rage and said over me some magic words, and I instantly became as you see me now, half man and half marble. Then this wicked enchantress changed the capital, which was a very populous and flourishing city, into the lake and desert plain you saw. The fish of four colors which are in it are the different races who lived in the town. The four hills are the four islands which gave the name to my kingdom. All this the enchantress told me to add to my trouble. And this is not all. Every day she comes to beat me with a whip of buffalo hide. When the young king had finished his sad story, he burst once more into tears, and the sultan was much moved. Tell me, he cried, where is this wicked woman, and where is the miserable object of her affection, whom she just manages to keep alive? Where she lives, I do not know, answered the unhappy prince but she goes every day at sunrise to see if the slave can yet speak after she has beaten me. Unfortunate king, said the sultan, I will do what I can to avenge you. He consulted with the young king over the best way to bring this about, and they agreed their plan should be put in effect the next day. The sultan then rested, and the young king gave himself up to happy hopes of release. The next day the sultan arose, and then went to the palace in the garden where the black slave was. He drew his sword and destroyed the little life that remained in him, and then threw the body down a well. He then laid down at the couch where the slave had been, and waited for the enchantress. She went first to the young king, whom she beat with a hundred blows. Then she came to the room where she thought her wounded slave was, but where the sultan really lay. She came near his couch and said, Are you better today, my dear slave? Speak but one word to me. How can I be better? answered the sultan, imitating the language of the Ethiopians, when I can never sleep for the cries and groans of your husband. What joy to hear you speak, answered the queen. Do you wish him to regain his proper shape? Yes, said the sultan. Hasten to set him at liberty so that I may no longer hear his cries. 
The queen at once went out and took a cup of water and set over it some words that made it boil as if it were on fire. Then she threw it over the prince, who at once regained his own form. He was filled with joy, but the enchantress said, Hasten away from this place and never come back, lest I kill you. The enchantress went back to the palace of tears and said, Now I have done what you wished. What you have done, said the sultan, is not enough to cure me. Every day at midnight all the people whom you have changed into fish lift their heads out of the lake and cry for vengeance. Go quickly and give them their proper shapes. The enchantress hurried away and said some words over the lake. The fish then became men, women, and children, and the houses and shops were once more filled. The sultan's suite, who had encamped by the lake, were not a little astonished to see themselves in the middle of a large and beautiful town. As soon as she had disenchanted it, the queen went back to the palace. "'Are you quite well now?' she said. "'Come nearer,' said the sultan. "'Nearer still.' She obeyed. Then he sprang up, and with one blow of his sword he cut her in two. Then he went and found the prince. "'Rejoice,' he said. "'Your cruel enemy is dead.' Dead. The prince thanked him again and again. And now, said the sultan, I will go back to my capital, which I am glad to find so near yours. So near mine, exclaimed the king of the black owls. Do you know it is a whole year's journey from here? You came here in a few hours because it was enchanted, but I will accompany you on your journey. It will give me much pleasure if you will escort me, said the sultan. As I have no children, I will make you my heir. The sultan and the prince set out together, the sultan laden with riches presented from the king of the black owls. The day after he reached his capital, the sultan assembled his court and told them all that had befallen him and told them how he intended to adopt the young king as his heir. Then he gave each man a present in proportion to his rank. As for the fisherman, as he was the first cause of the deliverance of the young prince, the sultan gave him much money and made him and his family happy for the rest of their days. The end.